This episode was pre-recorded as part of a live continuing education webinar. On-demand CEUs are still available for this presentation through all CEUs. Register at allceus.com slash counselor toolbox. Hey there, everybody, and welcome to today's presentation on the psychological impact of quarantine and what we can do to reduce it. I am your host, Dr. Donnelly Snipes. This presentation is based on the psychological impact of quarantine and how to reduce it, a rapid review of the literature put out by The Lancet today. So this is new news that you're getting as it breaks. In this presentation, we're going to review the effects of quarantine and explore ways to mitigate these effects. So what are we talking about here? Well, typically, quarantine means the separation and restriction of movement of people who have potentially been exposed to a contagious disease. So that's going to affect potentially, or affecting right now, a very, very small aspect of the uh, population. However, during a contagious outbreak like influenza, SARS, H1N1, Ebola, et cetera, and that's where all these studies were drawn from, many people choose to voluntarily restrict their movement to prevent getting ill. So they're on what we might consider a self-imposed quarantine. They may not even have any symptoms, but they don't want to get in contact with people who might be carriers or who might have symptoms. And that's one of the scary things about COVID right now is people can be carriers without having symptoms. So I think that's partially contributing to some of the panic. Many of the principles we will discuss here also apply to extended sheltering in place, which people experience after hurricanes or blizzards or other things where they may not know what happened on the, on the outside, so to speak. People who are quarantined or who have to shelter in place for more than 10 days often show significantly higher post-traumatic stress symptoms. Fears about their own health or getting sick and infecting others may continue for several months post-quarantine. That's really important to recognize that as soon as the problem is over or as soon as they've tested uh, negative for the, for the virus or for the illness or whatever, that doesn't mean that their fears aren't going to continue. Usually the um, continued fear goes on for months. There's hypervigilance to any symptoms of the illness. Now think about how you are just during a regular day or week or whatever, especially during flu season, when you start washing your hands more diligently and being alert every time you get a little sniffle, you're like, oh, I hope this isn't the flu. Part of that's because we know if you can get some of the flu medications within, I think it's the first 48 or 72 hours, that it greatly reduces the severity and duration of the flu. So you want to catch it quick, which means people are more hypervigilant to every little ache, pain, sniffle, sneeze, whatever. And that can cause people to focus too much on illnesses and even create some um, somatic symptoms because of their stress. That stress that they experience as a result of this hypervigilance also has the unfortunate side effect of reducing their immune system. We really want to help people reduce their stress to keep their immune system up in the case of outbreaks especially. And there's high-risk populations like pregnant women, parents of young children, and the elderly also show more distress and more negative rumination or more thinking about the disastrous consequences or fear about what could happen. And that totally makes sense, which is why it's important to provide them with accurate, clear, consistent information. Transparency is so key. And in today's world of the internet, you can go onto multiple news sites, and I can tell you with this current outbreak, you can go onto multiple news sites and multiple agency sites and get multiple different uh, accounts of what's going on, how bad it is, how bad it's going to get. You know, there are some that are more fear-mongering, and there are others that are saying, we got this. And it's very confusing, and it makes you wonder who's telling the truth, which creates a general sense of anxiety and unease. is really important, and I think the government at this point in time is doing a really good job uh, by appointing Mike Pence as the sort of lead person to make sure that all the information that is being disseminated is consistent across 
places. And we're going to talk about some more interventions later, but information is so key. In the short term during quarantine, whether you're mandatory quarantined at a hospital or a shelter of some sort, or you're voluntarily quarantining or self-sheltering in place, there can be separation from loved ones. You may not be able to visit as you would. The beauty with technology now is that as long as people have access to Wi-Fi, internet, mobile devices, so they can connect with their loved ones and keep tabs on them. You know, if you have parents who are elderly, who are three states away, the internet allows you to continue, even if you're sheltering in place and they're sheltering in place, you can continue to connect, check in on them, make sure they're doing okay. So separation from loved one is one loved ones is one that can easily be mitigated by making sure people have access to technology. Detachment from others is another short-term problem. Sometimes people are so stressed about getting sick in the case of, of illnesses and pandemics that they don't even want to deal with other people. They can't deal with any more input about the pandemic. They can't deal with any more input from others. They can't deal with the stress of potentially being exposed to someone who might be ill. They just don't want to be around other people. And that can be a problem. And again, good, effective education and communication about what's really going on and how to protect yourself is essential. The loss of freedoms can cause irritability and frustration if you are not able to maintain, and we're going to, the next one is loss of routine. If you're not able to maintain your routine, I go to the gym every morning. And if I'm not able to go to the gym every morning, then I am going to start to get a little bit edgy. If I am stuck at home, even after, you know, in, in Nashville, if we get half an inch of snow, the, the entire city su shuts down and um, shelves are cleared. You would think that there was something horrible going on. And a few years ago, we had several ins days where we were having to shelter in place because we couldn't get in and out of our neighborhood. We don't have the kind of snow plows and stuff that they have in Michigan and stuff. So we were stuck, I think it was nine days before we could go out. And that is very, very minimal compared to some of the things that we're talking about now with quarantines of two weeks, four weeks, things like that, and maybe self-quarantines for longer than that because people don't want to go out until the pandemic is subsiding, which could be months from now. So the loss of freedom that is imposed either by government or by the condition itself, whether it's, you know, a storm that keeps you stuck at home or um, illnesses that keep you from wanting to go out and be, be around anybody can cause a lot of frustration and anger. And you can just get irritable at the people that you're sheltering with, as well as at the situation. And it's, it's okay to be angry at the situation as long as you recognize it and figure out how to deal with it. Maintaining routine is so essential to maintain your circadian rhythms. Once your circadian rhythms start to get out of whack, you're going to start experiencing or have a much higher risk of experiencing mood symptoms. It's important to keep getting up about the same time each day, going to bed about the same time each day, eating about the same time each day, making sure that you're not sitting in the dark all day long. Get out, get some sunshine. Even in Florida, when we would have hurricanes come through and we would lose power for weeks at a time, it's dark in the house, but we could go outside and get exposure to sunlight, which would help set our circadian rhythms. It is really important. If you are a family, for example, uh, it's parents can develop and maintain a routine if kids are not able to go to school for a week or two weeks or whatever it is making sure they're still getting up about the same time making sure that they're reading or doing something that is semi school oriented during that period of time can be helpful you know make it fun it doesn't have to be sitting down and doing um their actual work from textbooks or something you know Encourage them to have fun with it so they don't think that, oh my gosh, this is horrible. I'm stuck at home and I'm still having to do, do all my schoolwork. But it's important that they keep those mental juices kind of flowing. 
Lack of access to basic supplies is another short-term problem. Whether it's because you can't get them because the shelves are clear and there are supply chain disruptions or you can't leave the house to get them, that is a big issue. People need to make sure that they have two weeks to a month or more of basic supplies, you know, squirreled away. It may not be the greatest stuff. You may not be able to have steak every night or whatever it is you eat, but plenty of food. So you're not hungry because hunger is going to contribute to irritability and mood issues and all kinds of things. Make sure you have plenty of food that you can eat. Make sure that you have any medicines that you need, at least a month supply, preferably a 90-day supply of those medications. And anything like electrolyte drinks and over-the-counter pain medications and things that you regularly use, make sure you have a stash of those ahead of time before any pandemic or hurricane or blizzard or anything be prepared have that you know we have a um stock if you will we have a stash that we keep in case there is something that happens to happen and we rotate the food through there every six months or so you know if we haven't had anything go on in six months then we pull the rice out and we start using that and replenish it with newer rice so if there is a problem we've got fresh food we don't want something that's like stale but those are preventative techniques that you can uh, have in place ahead of time if there's uncertainty over the status of the situation, that just creates a lot of anxiety. And it's important for people to not get stressed out over small changes here and there. We want to look at the big trend line. Okay, a new case was found today, or five new people were put in quarantine today. Okay, that's unfortunate. But is the trend line going up or is the trend line going down? And we tend to be more comfortable with these sorts of things when it happens with the flu, for example, because we have the flu every year. And the flu kills thousands and thousands of people every single year but we don't get nearly as fired up about it because we're used to it we know what to expect give or take we know that there are some medications that can help we know that when it starts to warm up the flu is going to go away we have more certainty over the status of the situation financial losses due to inability to work and the stock market can also cause a lot of stress for a lot of people um, in this particular situation that's going on today you're seeing the stock market is just plummeting and correcting itself as some of the people on TV would say but and, and that's causing a lot of angst among people who are close to retirement because they've seen you know 20 or 30 percent of their retirement suddenly disappear and they're thinking oh my gosh you know i worked so many years to save that money so they're angry they're anxious they don't know where the bottom is and that's another area where we need open and transparent communication and really strong leadership in order to help control panic and fear in some situations, like SARS, the research has shown that people, especially those who live at or below 300% of the poverty level, um, may end up having dependence on family members to provide financial assistance during quarantine, and that may cause conflicts among family members. They're having to have money wired to them or something, and that can be really challenging. We see the same thing after... Uh, hurricanes when people are homeless or displaced and they have to go live with family members it can cause a lot of stress especially if those family relations were already kind of tenuous but even if they weren't you take people who are stressed and force them to be together or force them to support one another and there can be conflicts and disagreements about how different people are handling things the third aspect of financial loss that was discussed in the article was inability to work. If you are sheltered and you are in one of those positions where you've got to go to work to get paid, if you work in as a waiter or a waitress or a hostess or a host or um, I'm thinking restaurants right now, obviously, because I'm hungry. But if you work in one of those jobs where you can't do it virtually, then you may not have a job 
you may lose your job. You may not be able to go to work if you are quarantined, which means you're not going to you may not be getting paid, which can contribute to significant financial losses for the individual. Now, some people, again, through the advent of technology, are able to maintain their jobs. Um, fast food places and restaurants potentially um, may be able to keep a skeleton staff to run the kitchen and do a lot of delivery, um, delivery procedures would have to be altered to minimize contact between the person who's ordering and the person who's delivering so you know they don't um, expose each other and lots of hand washing and stuff but i can see ways that protocols can be put in place where delivery could happen that would mean that things like amazon and walmart and kroger and other stores that have a big online presence could still create protocols where they could deliver basic non-perishable necessities. And in the case of local grocery stores, if they were able to keep their shelves stocked, then they may be able to even de deliver perishables, which a lot of big cities, grocery stores are starting to deliver perishables, which is awesome for people who are homebound, but that's a whole different issue. So be creative and don't start freaking out um, initially that everything's going to close down, but do recognize that people who are dependent on a job that they can't do virtually um, may start losing a lot of work hours, start losing a lot of money, which is going to impact their ability to pay their bills, pay their mortgage, those sorts of things. The government may have to put in some stop gaps in order to assist those people if the quarantine goes on, if a mandatory quarantine goes on for a long period of time. Now, if it is a voluntary sheltering in place, the person just doesn't want to go out, that's a whole different thing. And they're probably not going to be able to access any sort of government relief or benefits if it wasn't a government mandated quarantine. Other short-term reactions in the case of potential exposure to whatever it is, the acute stress disorder is found to be about 34% for people who are under mandatory quarantine versus 12% for those in the general population. So thinking about the current COVID outbreak, uh, people who are under mandatory quarantine um, are much more likely to develop symptoms of acute stress disorder than the quote general public like us who are out here and still trying to figure out what's going on with this with this illness exhaustion when you're stressed and I'm, your hpa axis or your threat response system ramps up and that tells your body there is a problem there may be a problem we need to gear up in case we need to fight or flee so you are running hot if you will it's kind of like uh, revving the engine on the car and getting ready to take off from the line your body is primed well doing that for too long leads to exhaustion and irritability anger insomnia if you are telling yourself there's a threat if you are constantly having threat related thoughts it's going to be hard to relax and wind down and get good sleep worry may keep you up You'll have difficulty concentrating and indecisiveness. All of these are the result of a overactive HPA axis, which can contribute to development of symptoms of anxiety or depression. You may also have anxiety when around people who are sick. I just came back from Chicago and going through the um, airport, you know, I was much more vigilant to notice people who were coughing who were wearing masks, those sorts of things, where I'm not really concerned, um, or at least at that point, I wasn't really concerned about the virus in the U.S. I was more concerned about the flu. Uh, seeing people and being around, I was more noticing of people who were displaying symptoms of having something like the flu. Deteriorating work performance can happen for people who are still working, um, despite, you know, sheltering or despite what's going on because they are exhausted, because their anxiety is running higher, because they're so distracted by the potential of the illness that they can't focus at work.
And reluctance to go into public and consideration of resignation from work are also things that happen when uh, viruses, when illnesses become um, a pandemic, become super problematic. People may start considering what to do. Um, think back to H1N1 or the SARS or Ebola. There were a lot of people who got freaked out, who got really stressed out because they were not getting enough information and there wasn't enough information. And so they started thinking, you know what, the government's not, you know, protecting me. I need to protect myself. I need to stay home. And they started considering resigning from work. They didn't want to go into public. And that in and of itself starts having major negative um, effects on the economy as well as on their self-esteem and on their feelings of hope and empowerment because they feel helpless, powerless, and trapped. We want to make sure we start addressing those things early and make sure people feel comfortable doing what they need to do and make sure people know that they're going to have access to resources. Confusion and a perception of lack of transparency about the severity of the problem can be created due to differences in style, approach, and content of the various public health messages because of poor coordination between multiple jurisdictions and levels of government involved. We've seen that with every single illness that has come out from H1N1 to Ebola to uh, the current coronavirus. You go to one news outlet and you get this information. You go to the CDC and you get this information. You go somewhere else, you get some more information. And nobody is, seems like they're telling you the whole picture. And it's very unnerving uh, to think that, you know, you're only getting bits and pieces of it and you wonder what you're missing. Lack of clarity about the different levels of risk causes people to fear and ruminate on the worst. You know, we don't know how much risk we have. We've heard that you can be a carrier without having symptoms, so that makes people nervous. We've heard that, you know, there was this outbreak had started occurring and millions of people had fled the central outbreak area before um, quarantines were put in place. So we don't know necessarily who actually was there and whether they've all been quarantined and who they came in contact with on the uh, on cruise ships, on airplanes and airports, those sorts of things. So there's a lot of uncertainty about what has happened, but we can't change the past. All we can do right now is focus on what's going on right now and what does the picture look like. And notice the positives, such as there are a couple of different companies that believe that they are going to have a vaccine or a treatment for this particular outbreak in short order. You know, one says anywhere from, from 90 days to, you know, six months. Another one says anywhere from 12 months to 18 months. But still, that is an end in sight. It's not like you're thinking, well, this could go on for years. No. Um, it's very likely that there are going to be interventions in, in very short order. Another issue that people face is continued stigma long after the outbreak has been contained for those perceived to be at high risk, those who had been, who had been sick, or those who had been exposed even if they didn't get sick. A lot of times the public, their friends, their family who wasn't, weren't quarantined or whatever, may avoid them, withdraw social invitations, treat them with fear and suspicion, or make critical comments. And that can be very hurtful, leading to their sense of isolation. Additionally, this stigma can lead to disenfra disenfranchisement of minority groups and families under quarantine who may belong to different ethnic groups, tribes, or religions. This was particularly paramount during the Ebola crisis some years ago. But we do want to recognize that there are similar um, messages whether they're accurate or not, I don't know, but there are similar messages being floated out there in mainstream media about the current coronavirus, which is contributing to stigma of certain populations and certain people. And again, those who have, you know, traveled may be seen as being at higher risk and may be um, disinvited to a lot of things.
general education about the disease and the rationale for quarantine and public health information provided to the general public can be greatly beneficial to reduce stigma. We keep coming back to this education piece, but we need to get it out. Detailed information targeted at schools and workplaces might also be useful, needing to remember to target it to the appropriate age level and the appropriate comprehension level of the people that you're targeting. If you're talking to middle school students, high school students, college students, doctors, you're going to have different approaches to conveying your message and helping people feel safe and knowing what they need to do to stay safe. Media reporting, and this came from the article itself, media reporting contributes to the stigma and trauma due to their dramatic headlines and fear-mongering. There is research that shows that mainstream media actually contributes to people's traumatic reactions because of their headlines and fear-mongering. So let's encourage the media to start putting out positive stories about what we can do instead of what the possible cat catastrophe is. Let's look at what can we do to protect ourselves. Let's look at what can we do to help ourselves. Let's look at something besides the virus because you know what? There's other stuff going on in the world. Hopefully they can find something positive to report on. Um, public health officials need to provide rapid, clear messages delivered effectively for the entire affected population that includes people who haven't been um, exposed, you know, like everybody in, well, pretty much all over the world right now, to promote accurate understanding of the situation. It would be great if WHO, the World Health Organization, you know, was actually able to take the lead and make sure that everybody in every country had the most up-to-date, accurate information instead of having to, you know, spot check and try to figure out what information we're getting completely, what information is right, what information is wrong. Let's have somewhere where we can go that we know it's accurate. Another way, another issue is getting the information to the public. I was so angry, so angry a couple of days ago when President Trump did his um, six o'clock broadcast. It was 6 p.m. EST. It was right in the middle of the news. So, you know, it wasn't even taken off good shows. Sorry. Um, but it, it was right in the middle of the news. And none of the stations that we got, you know, the mainstream media, C CBS, NBC, ABC, and even the Fox, local Fox News channel did not hold his broadcast. You wouldn't have even known that he spent almost an hour talking about the status of the coronavirus and what we're doing and what he's doing to protect the country. You wouldn't have even known that. And even the next day, it didn't hardly show up as a blip in the media because the media chose not to inform the public. It would be wonderful if the government somewhere could choose during times of crisis like this, to do things like they did back, you know, when I was younger and we only had three channels, if the president was on, the president was on and there was no getting around it. He was going to be on every single channel. Um, and it would be great if we could go back to that. So when there is something that everybody in the country really needs to know, that they have access to it if they're able to turn on a TV. Social media is another way to push the message out. Uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, letting people know, you know, the basics. You can only communicate so much in Instagram, but it's important to make sure that people have links to those websites that have the credible information like the World Health Organization. And making sure that there is a single point of contact website. I already kind of talked about that. Would love to see it be the World Health Organization in partnership with CDC, combining to create this unified message that lets us know, hey, this is what's going on with this particular outbreak. And it could be influenza, it could be coronavirus, it could be any of the things that we've dealt with or anything that we may deal with in the future. But that way we know there's one go-to place where we can get that accurate information. And Journalists know that there's one go-to place that they can get accurate information. 
longer term effects when the outbreak is over doesn't mean the crisis is over three years after the SARS outbreak alcohol abuse or dependency symptoms were positively associated with having been quarantined or worked with high-risk populations so those people who were in law enforcement military what whoever they used to control the SARS out, outbreak and enforce quarantine the medical professionals anyone who came into contact um, had a much higher risk of substance dependence after quarantine many participants continued to engage in avoidance behaviors such as minimizing direct contact with patients or just not reporting for work 54 percent of people who'd been quarantined continued to avoid those who may be coughing or sneezing and tended to have higher anxiety whenever they were around somebody who was coughing or sneezing it triggered that stress reaction even if it was just you know allergies that particular behavior of sneezing we'll say um, would trigger a stress reaction in them 26 percent of people after a pandemic um, avoided crowded pla crowded places especially those that are enclosed like movie theaters concerts um, you know to some extent crowded restaurants subways those sorts of things 21 percent avoided all public spaces in the months following the quarantine period it is really vital for the economy of every country not just the u.s that we get a message out there once we get a hold on this virus um, about what to do to stay safe and help get people out and back into public places and back patronizing stores and going back to work to make the goods we need to support stock the shelves in the stores and supply the restaurants it is so important to communicate effectively about what we need to do and the fact that you know what we are safe and we do know what we're doing we need to make sure that the people who are communicating that message actually sound like they are believable and they know what they're talking about and this is goes back to that transparency and unified message longer term behavioral changes after the quarantine period included continued vigilant hand washing avoidance of crowds and lack of access to basic supplies was associated with continued anxiety and anger four to six months after release now this means during the quarantine period if people lacked access to basic supplies then they were constantly worried that it was going to happen again for four to six months after the quarantine period they may have been stockpiling food and they may have been anxious and worried that they weren't going to be able to um, keep an adequate supply of their medication supply chain disruption is a huge issue especially for people who are on daily medication uh, we need to put the message out there about what we plan to do as a government as a country as a um, health care provider to ensure that people can access the medications and supplies they need to meet their basic needs that's going to help people feel a lot calmer other interventions aside from providing a unified public message about what's happening safety measures that are being undertaken emergency plans and the likelihood of deterioration of the situation we can provide meaningful activities for people while in quarantine if they are quarantined at a hospital or a shelter that may fall upon the staff at that hospital or shelter and it's important to keep people engaged keep them in their routine in a routine and make sure that they have something to do boredom is and when they're just sitting around mulling things over is when they're going to start focusing on what they're upset about what they're angry about what they're frustrated about what they're afraid of and that's going to stir discontent and cause more problems the same thing is true if you're sheltering in place i use that term kind of broadly if your family has decided not to go out it's still important to make sure that everybody in your family not just the kids have meaningful activities to engage in so they're not sitting around so they're not feeling uh, depressed withdrawn irritable 
We need to ensure that basic supplies such as food, water, and medical supplies are available. Part of this comes with proper prior planning. When the authorities say, make sure you have two weeks or a month worth of food and water, do it. You may not need it. And if you don't, that's fine. When the crisis is over, you can go through it. It's not like it's going to spoil um, in, in that short of a time. But it's important to make sure that you have it available if you need it. Reinforce the sense of altruism and safety, helping one another. What can we do to help one another during these times, um, making sure that we provide as much assistance to our fellow neighbor, person, citizen as we can is going to be important. In healthcare, for example, again, technology, so awesome because we can do um, doctor visits. We can do mental health visits online. We can do training online. We can do schooling online. Kids can go, and, and thousands of children do every single day, go to online public school. So in the event of an extended uh, quarantine or an extended crisis, it is possible for people to continue their education. Their life doesn't have to be put on hold, and we need to have those processes in place to switch to the quarantine protocol, if you want to call it that. Um, so in behavioral health organizations, for example, um, instead of seeing people in clinic, you're seeing people via video conferencing. Um, schools are providing online education during that period in order to prevent the spread of the virus. I know around here, in Middle Tennessee, every single year that we've been here, there has been there have been school closings for a week or more because of the flu, and that's a problem. You know that is a big problem because that means that the schools are basically petri dishes <laughs> for that flu because their you know protocols aren't super strong. You know a lot of teenagers are not great about washing their hands or covering their mouth and nose when they sneeze and things like that. So considering um, it, it, it is important for school districts and governments to consider offering online schooling for people who are sick or at risk of being sick. I know my children were both premature and they had much lower um, immune systems. So it was much more dangerous when flu and illnesses started going around. And eventually with my daughter, I had to pull her out completely of daycare because she kept ending up in the hospital. And uh, because of her um, suppressed immune system. So for people who are at high risk because they have asthma or um, impaired immunity or they're elderly or they're pregnant, making sure that we offer alternatives even every year when the flu comes around, let alone when there's some unknown pandemic, would be very helpful to promoting confidence. Because if we're practicing that every year, then if a big pandemic happens, which we hope it doesn't, but if it ever does, uh, then we've already practiced the procedures for how to handle something like that. And we already have the... Um, stuff in place in order to switch gears from face-to-face brick-and-mortar education, for example, or face-to-face brick-and-mortar doctor's appointments to online appointments and online teaching. Those involved with public safety and health care are in uniquely dangerous positions and require additional organizational support and disaster planning to mitigate risk. If you are working in an emergency room, for example, and you are having to see people who are sick on a day-to-day -day basis, you may be afraid to go home to your family because you don't want it, you don't know if you've been exposed and you don't want to risk exposing your family. So there's more fear because you're regularly being exposed to something that might be the problem or might not be, and you just don't know. For other providers, uh, making sure, like I said, for doctors and um, behavioral health care providers, disaster plans to mitigate risk, and teachers, disaster plans to mitigate risk can also means switching to providing 
services via technology to prevent that close contact. Health officials charged with implementing quarantine who often have reasonable job security need to remember that not everyone is in the same situation. Even though, you know, some people may have job security, may still be getting a paycheck through all this, there are a lot of people who won't be. And it's important to recognize and be sensitive and as altruistic as possible to those people, for example, who work jobs that are hourly. They're there, they get paid. They're not there, they don't get paid. And, you know, that's, that's a problem. Those of us who work salary, we get paid for 40 hours a week, pretty much regardless. That is a whole different thing. There's a whole, whole set of comfort that goes along with being a salaried employee. And we need to have empathy for those who are hourly. Information is key. People who are quarantined need to understand the situation, understand what's going on, whether they are mandatory quarantined or voluntarily sheltering in place. Effective and rapid communication is essential. And this is true whether it is a pandemic of some sort of illness or after a um, natural disaster. Effective and rapid communication is essential about what's the status of things. Do we have water? Do we have food? Is the supply chain disrupted? Even in hurricanes, we have the disruption of um, oil. We have the disruption of power. We have the disruption of food being able to get into certain places. After Katrina, think about it, or um, Andrew or, or some Harvey, there were huge sections of the country that were not able to get food as or water or power as quickly as they needed it. And there were shortages and there was a lot of stress surrounding it. So it's important that we make sure that people have information about what's going on and how, how the government or the um, organizations are mitigating that risk. Supplies, both general and medical, need to be provided or available. Online shopping is a great thing. The challenge comes in who packs the stuff, because people who are packing it in the um, distribution centers are going to have to be, you know, present to do it. So we need to have people that are willing to show up and pack. We have to be, have people that are willing to show up and deliver packages to individual doorsteps. And, you know, that, can be, that could be a problem, even if there is the supply of goods. Having the people to disseminate the goods may be a problem unless we have a really good plan for how to keep them safe. You know, how are we going to keep those people safe that are in the distribution center? Um, for example, using a, they have... Um, UV light, UV, UV sterilizer lights that they use in a lot of hospitals that help sterilize the air. Um, there are a lot of protocols that organizations can put in place to help keep their staff safe as well as to help them feel like they're safe. There's, you know, we need to not only be safe, but believe that we are safe. The quarantine period should be short and the duration should not be changed unless there's extreme circumstances. They found that duration of quarantine longer than 10 days is associated with much worse psychological outcomes. Most of the adverse effects come from the imposition of restrictions on freedom. Voluntary quarantine is associated with less distress and fewer long-term complications, but there is still a certain amount of anxiety in those particular people. Public health officials should emphasize the altruistic choice of self-isolating for people who think they may have been exposed in order to help the government, because the government can't be everywhere all the time, in order to help the country contain whatever issue might be going on if it is an infectious issue. There was a lot of information in that article, and I encourage you to read it, but I hope that summary provided you some tools in order to know what you can do in your community in order to help mitigate the psychological consequences of the uh, current situation.